Hello, and welcome to the EuroWhat, episode number 64 for the week of October 22nd, 2019. I'm Ben Smith, and I'm joined today by Mike McComb. Hi, Mike. Ahoy. We are a pair of Americans trying to make sense of the Eurovision Song Contest, and this week we'll be talking about the big tie of 1969. Mm. How is your October going, Mike? Oh, goodness. So many things. Uh, yeah, just a lot of activity. None of it Eurovision related. It's all, uh, all, all the craziness seems to have coalesced around this particular month. So uh, it's nice to have this as a little bit of a mental break, a mental escape. Mm-hmm. A nice little mental break where we can talk about the Eurovision Song Contest for like 45 minutes, roughly. Oh, yeah, something like that. So- somewhere and in there. How is your month going? Uh, it's good. It's It's busy over here, too, for... Also non-Eurovision related reasons, it's nice to have this little island of calm, or this island yes. of just very silly procedural things. Yes. The sillier the procedures, the better. So. Yes. <laughs> which, uh, spoiler alert, we get to talk about procedure this episode, which is a big oh, fun goodness. thing for both of us. Yeah. Possibly the silliest of uh, procedural nonsense. So. Yeah. <laughs> just a big oopsie in when they planned out how the contest worked. Before we get to that, though, let's check in on how many countries have currently signed up since we are nearing slash have passed the date that they're supposed to officially confirm. There are still a few that are holding out. Armenia, Bulgaria, Hungary, Moldova. And like Bulgaria told us end of September and like it's September 51st. Like we'll get there eventually. Yeah, give them time. (laughs) I just feel like so many of those are always there. And it's just a matter of them like officially figuring out how they're picking their entrance so they can make a big announcement and be like, yes, mm-hmm. we signed the paperwork. It's one thing to just say like, oh, we're going to be there. It's just like, oh, you need a little bit more in your press. Yeah, yeah you and... want to have things a little bit more planned out. They're also going to do a lot of junior Eurovision stuff. So. Oh, yeah, true. You got to wrangle the kids. So since we last spoke about who's participating, a lot of decisions have been made. Everybody's figuring their their stuff out. Uh, Italy will be there. Yay! Yeah, they, they I don't think they've necessarily confirmed one, one way or the other whether San Remo will actually be the selection method, but it probably will be. Mm-hmm. San Remo is still going to happen. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's been working for them, so uh, it, yeah. I, I don't know why they would change that. So. No, absolutely not. Uh, Lat- <laughs> Speaking of things that are definitely working and definitely should not be changed, Latvia is doing Supernova again. <sighs> I, I, although I love Supernova and like what the what that selection process is, I am very surprised that they are using that as their selection process, mm-hmm. given how it has not actually worked the last three years. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Like Aminata could have written like eighteen songs in that time, and oh. like they're and they're all ready to go. Oh, if that is the case, then I take back everything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that would sway you too. Yes, yeah, Supernova is a good thing again, but we'll yeah. see. It's it's yeah. October. We're fine. Honestly, I would have guessed that they would have just said like, all right, Marcus Riva, we know you're going to be at Supernova anyway. Why don't we just send you and then just get that off of our checklist and move on. But <laughs> yeah, let's just plan on the schedule a song for Marcus and we're done. Malta had, it was like X Factor's working great, which I would agree. So X Factor will be used to choose the artist again. That's currently underway. Yeah, uh, I believe this past weekend was the second week of auditions. It's geo blocked here, so I've not been mm-hmm. keeping very close tabs on it. Also, with Masked Singer happening here, I only have so much mental space for my singing mm-hmm. competitions. Yes, so. yeah, and, and like that's <laughs> like right now, that's the right choice. Yes, they're all so good on the show this season, or at least they've weeded out the ones that are less good so far. Sorry, Paul Schaefer. Uh, Sorry, Paul Schaefer, but also <laughs> come on. Yeah. Come on. And then also in terms of singing competitions, Georgia Idol will be starting up this Saturday. They are doing the same process they used last year. They're just starting the process a little bit earlier. I think last year they started in January and finished in March. And I don't know if they're expanding the season at all or anything mm-hmm. like that. Ukraine has announced that they will not allow contestants with a performance history in Russia to participate in Vidbeer next year, which... Given all of the fun that we saw this year around that, I, I get it. Yeah, I. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's gonna get messy and like full of drama for no reason whatsoever because that's just how Ukraine rolls. That's, and that's, just, that's why we love them. But that's just what good beer is. is- <laughs> yeah, but like. I really enjoyed the article that WeWe Blogs put up of all of the artists that, uh, based on this new rule, would not be able to participate in Vidbeer, and it includes 
several Eurovision alumni, like Jamala, who was at the center of this year's controversy. She wouldn't be able to compete. Ani Lorak, Svetlana uh, from 2009. Yeah, like none of them would be. I, able. I'm just like picturing whenever SNL makes fun of like a prescription drug and you have like just the text covering the screen of just all the side effects. Mm-hmm. But just that that's just the list of Ukrainian artists that are, that are unable yeah. to perform in Vidbeer. <laughs> just filling the screen right now. The one that I was just pleased to see, but that's because I'm just generally pleased by Iceland, is Iceland has seen a 20% increase in submissions for Song of the in this year. 157 total for next year's contest. Yeah, and considering that they only have, what is it, 10 entries in their selection process at the end? Yeah, like that's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's, that's a, a competitive field. That's a lot. Uh, 157 is more artists than are performing at Iceland Airwaves in a few weeks. Huh. Although Iceland Airwaves has a lot of artists that are not Icelandic. Mm. That's a lot of songs. I wonder how many of the artists that are going to be performing there that are eligible to compete in Song Vikepnin, what that Venn diagram is going to look like. Yeah, what, so. <laughs> what is that Venn diagram? Especially because like Iceland did very well. As, as a nation with Hattori, uh, Hattori is seeing a mm-hmm. lot of post-contest fame, mm-hmm. which is great. And I think it really shows that Eurovision doesn't need to be this sort of one-off thing that you aim for, where you can be an existing band and do your thing as a band. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, I think it leads to stronger entries, because if you look at who's won, it is these very idiosyncratic entries. Yes, I agree. Although... I don't know. These could be 157 Hatari clones. And Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious what that would look like Mm -hmm. and uh, if if, if we will be better off in society for it. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) your days are numbered capitalism. Yeah, I was going to say, I love a good Hera Bjork song, but also I I wouldn't mind the slider for Iceland being being somewhere closer to the Hatari side of things. Mm -hmm. Talking about Hungary, who has not officially confirmed... Uh, they did drop all of the details for a doll, which is still happening, but it, it doesn't appear that it's guaranteed that if you win a doll, you're going to Eurovision. And everybody is speculating because no details are out and that's all we can do is speculate. I, I'd be fine with that. In the announcement for a doll, they just, there was no mention of Eurovision whatsoever. And given how this year's version went, like it just, it wasn't the strongest field. There was the plagiarism scandal that caused a song to get disqualified, which really messed up a whole bunch of results. And I'm hoping that this means that Hungary is just considering either an internal selection or like if you're an adult finalist, then you'll be up for consideration. And it's just not like a guarantee if you win. But Mm -hmm. yeah, and and they could also just be finalizing some details. Yeah, I'm not sure where they are in the contestant selection process. So there could just be some contractual conflicts that are preventing some potential contestants from being able to compete at Eurovision, Mm -hmm. but they still want them on a doll. So yeah, like, well, yeah, like the big one that everybody was making a big deal out of was I think that the the range that the song had to have been like new from was outside the standard Eurovision range. So it was like, oh no, they're mm. dropping out. And like, guys, no, they're probably just trying to widen the pool a little bit and find find a good artist. And if they need, to, and if one wins where the song doesn't work, picking a song that works. Right, and and it could also be a case of they're trying to find an artist rather than the whole package. Mm-hmm. My hope is just that Hungary is participating and not taking a like, oh, we didn't qualify. We're, we're just gonna go sit in the corner for a couple years because yeah that's no fun that's no fun hungry's always a welcome presence that is it on country news all right well uh looking at the ebu website they posted over the weekend the job description for the executive supervisor role the the jan olasand role and yeah, it was kind of fun to go through and see what the actual responsibilities are for the next Jan Olasand. There were a couple of bullet points that I just wanted to pull out uh, that I thought were kind of delightful. Yes. In the general description at the top, as the ESC is an apolitical event, but with a potential political impact, overall and political stakeholder management is a key role for the executive supervisor. I'm, I'm going to take a quick look here, just looking down the, 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 the first letter in the headings 
to see if it spells out drink. Yeah. <laughs> BYOB, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, what else? He or she is responsible for ensuring that all the post broadcasters and the public broadcasters are not at any time in breach of the ESC rules and can, after consultation with the reference group chairman and in accordance with the ESC rules, decide to ban, change, or modify any entry at any time before the execution of the shows. So help me, I will turn this car around. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, wow, that, I, I don't think he's ever really had to, like, swing that axe, but yeah, it's interesting that he's, he has that power. And then uh, similarly, the executive supervisor of the SC will also supervise uh, junior Eurovision, delegated to a project manager. So even even Jan Olasan is like, eh, <laughs> it's like nope, nope, whatever. that's someone else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the coolest part of the job description, uh, they have different subject matter expert categories. And uh, this role is qualified as a top expert and is recognized as the absolute guru in his or her field. I think that's kind of neat. He is officially yeah, like, I a would, guru I would love to have this, a job so. position that's top expert. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, unfortunately, I am ineligible to, to apply. I do not have a master's degree, and I do not have an MBA, so I am mm. right out. Plus, my, my French is not proficient. Yeah, my, my, my French is uh, no bueno as well. And... <laughs> uh, <laughs> And oh. yeah, and and I have no direct broadcasting experience uh, outside of this podcast, so I don't know. There's only so much so much you can fake it. So. Mike, Mike, Mike. I did radio yeah. in college, so that we were covered there. Okay, uh, you have the master's degree, right? I, I'm happy to be called top expert, and we can probably just rope in Duolingo for the French okay. part. All right. So we just need to find a big enough trench coat so that yes. we can like, be stacked on top of each other's shoulders. There we go. So, <laughs> And honestly, it's just nasty because the, the two of us on one another's shoulders is just is really going to tower over anybody in the room. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, well, no, I was going to say, like, if they were based in the Netherlands, I'm sure there's enough, like, ceiling clearance for that sort of height. But uh, – <laughs> Don't think that's the case in Geneva, unfortunately. No, so, no. but if you think you are qualified for this role, uh, we, we will have a link to the uh, PDF for it in our show notes. So, good luck if you apply. Okay, so I had an interesting uh, Twitter thing that happened mm -hmm. on our Twitter this week. Uh, so uh, Johnny reached out and and was like, "Hey, I'm finally listening to episode 60. Did you guys ever figure out what the German postcard is?" And oh, my yeah, immediate response one. was, "No." It's probably some Grimm's fairy tale, perhaps. And then uh, they did the the legwork for us. It's Max and Moritz, which is a German folktale in verse. Uh -huh. uh, just about two horrible boys playing pranks on a widow and various other people. Okay. <laughs> From, and this is this is mostly just me reading Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, mm. uh, based on based on rewatching the postcard, uh, the, it is prank number two that they commit on a widow. Where while she is busy uh, doing stuff in her yard after they have like destroyed her horses essentially because oh, they geez. are terrible boys they are like stealing meat out of her kitchen via the chimney. Okay, uh... <laughs> it's a whole deal. And then like this weekend, I don't remember the exact context it came up with, but I was at a puzzle thing with the person who designed the logo of the show, and I was talking about this postcard, and I was like, no, 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 you need to see this so you understand what I'm talking about. He's like, oh, it's the Cats and Jammer Kids. So then okay. I had to Google the Cats and Jammer Kids, and yes, it's the Cats and Jammer Kids. So there you go. Huh. Max and Moritz are the Cats and Jammer Kids are a German folktale. Ta-da. <laughs> wow, I have learned so much in the last two minutes. Uh, yep. yep. <laughs> I, I recognize none of those words. So. I'm glad that we... We're able to figure it out. Case closed. More Googling. Yes, exactly. But uh, yes, uh, thank thank you, Johnny, for uh, helping us figure that Get out. Get to the bottom of that weird postcard. Answering our main question and creating several, several more questions. <laughs> several sub questions so <laughs> that we will address at some point. That kind of does it for the news desk, which uh, let's talk about the one time that four countries tie. We're talking about Jan Olasan. We're talking about the person who makes Eurovision happen and helps oversee all of the, the stuff between countries. Mm -hmm. So now let's go back to a time where we didn't have that and why it caused problems. So Eurovision 1969 was the 14th Eurovision Song Contest and the second to be televised in color. Hmm. 16 countries participated. 27 countries broadcast the contest. 
uh, because it was in Spain and he was the artist of the moment, uh, Salvador Dali was involved uh, primarily with the promo poster, which shows right at the beginning of the video, which you can find on YouTube. And mm-hmm. like the weird pipe organ thingy that was on stage was was a Salvador Dali sculpture. Hmm. That does not surprise me. So. No, no, no. If you look at the poster, it feels like just right on brand for him. Okay. Uh, and then, so we've talked about scoring before and how scoring has changed. So we are at a moment in the contest very early on. Uh, juries consisted of 10 members. Each of them gives the song that they liked best a point, which meant that there were 160 points up for grabs. This became a problem because Spain, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and France all ended up with 18 points each. And there were no tiebreaker rules in place so and like we now have a situation where it's not just two countries that are tied it is four countries that are tied in lieu of any sort of tiebreaker structure all four of the nations were declared winners how do you not have a tiebreaker system in place when it's just a sink what wow that that is baffling to me yeah nobody sat down at like year five was like okay so what happens if two nations win how do we figure that out Especially when it's just basically the Democratic primary, where it's just like, oh, yeah, yes. we're just choosing between 18... Oh, goodness. Yeah, we're choosing between 18 things. Although, one thing that occurs to me, and that we have talked about recently, is that back in the early days of the contest, they were essentially starting from scratch every year. True. It was just, well, you won, so you can host. And then every nation was not passing a binder from nation to nation with, this is how we do things. Mm-hmm. So it it totally makes sense to me that everybody would just like, well, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out later. This is for like next year's winner to figure out. And by the time that you get to four nations tying, the first time that a tie happens, nothing has been set in stone. Wow. All four nations are now joint winners. All of the singers received medals. And typically uh, medals would go to both singers and songwriters. But again, we suddenly have four winners. So there are no medals for the songwriters to to get. Oh jeez. We have not planned for this situation at all. Even watching the video, like the the woman hosting the contest, she was just like, "Wait, are you sure it's a tie?" Like like she had to ask several times to yeah. make sure that like Someone the results Someone please check were the final. numbers, yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah. The and like the full show would have been 90 minutes, but because of because we do have rules at the contest that the winner performs at the end. We don't have rules mm-hmm. that the, for, for what to do if there's a tie, but we have rules for the person who won plays their song again. Yeah. Uh, uh, all four winners have to perform. No one oh, seems goodness. thrilled by this because they're not the they're not the sole winner. Yeah. And then in the aftermath of that, mm-hmm. in 1970, there's like a bunch of protesting. Like Portugal, Norway, Finland, and Sweden all sit out because they're mad. Jeez. Oh, so you have only 12 nations performing at the contest in 1970. Uh, the EBU's like, oh man, we should take a look at this whole Eurovision thing and try to figure out what to do. They make no changes to how points are given out. Despite the fact that that caused this situation, oh man! Uh, but they but they did put in tiebreaker rules. So how did the tiebreaker rules work? Let's see. So I was digging around looking for like the the nineteen seventy tiebreaker rules and could not find them. So I I can only apply the nineteen ninety one rules. Mm, well, okay. the nineteen ninety one rules and then the more recent rules. And the nineteen ninety one rules may actually be the rules that from like nineteen seventy until the nineties. Mm. So, according to 1991 Eurovision rules, the country receiving the highest score from any other country would win. In this case, looking at the the four-way tie, the Netherlands would have won because they got six points from France. Okay. Uh, The UK would have come second with five points from Sweden. Mm. Under current tiebreaker rules in the contest, we have a completely different result. Uh, Which is great, because if if you really stan one of these four songs, you can probably figure out the math that will get in your favor. Uh, So according to current tiebreaker rules, the song receiving votes from the most countries would win, then the song receiving the most high-value votes in case of another tie. Okay. And that comes into play here because France would have won with Spain in second. Both of them received points from nine countries. France received four points from two countries. And then Spain received three points as their highest vote. Ah. So, So that's how it all shakes out. And again, you can basically figure out tiebreaker rules that will let any of the countries you like best win. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't really solve the problem. Oh, it, does, it, does, it most way. certainly does yeah. not. Oh, goodness. In the spirit of trying to sort these things out, I was like, what if we put these four songs head to head because there's four of them and we could have done a bracket. But then earlier over the week, I was like, no, let's not, let's not do that. Let's just put them head to head to head to head. Okay. Since the Netherlands hosted in 1970 and since they're going to be hosting in 2020, let's talk about the Netherlands first. Their entry was De Troubadour by Lenny Kerr. I 
like this one. I do too. Like, I think if I had to pick one of the four of these, this is the one I would pick because it's it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, I really like her voice and she has a really strong stage presence. Mm -hmm. Learning Dutch in preparation for next year, it's just kind of a harsh delivery system for really any song, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, As someone who is also currently working through Dutch Duolingo, yes. Yeah, I wouldn't describe this song as timeless, but you could plug it in to any time frame if that kind of makes sense like the song by itself is not a timeless Mm -hmm. piece but it's something that if it were an entry next year or 20 years ago or 20 years from now Mm -hmm. i think it would be a viable entry but there's Mm -hmm. just nothing specific about it that gives it like this timeless like oh this is a classic you know Mm -hmm. yes agreed where we're yeah again like it's not classic but it also could totally come unstuck in time and i wouldn't notice right exactly okay any other thoughts on this one looking up like factoids about the different uh entries uh since this this is a contest just full of little bits of trivia it Uh, is there are so many good bits yeah uh for this one it's the first winning song to be written by a woman which seems kind of shocking given that this is the 14th contest. She's also the first woman to win while playing an instrument on stage. And I love it when, I don't know, the superlatives start just getting very specific Just has specific like, like three that. asterisks and one of those little cross icons for to, to tell you to go to that note in the footnotes of right, first yeah, woman to just... win <laughs> while playing an instrument on stage. Yeah, and then it's just like the next iteration of that. It's like, oh, first woman to win while playing uh, an instrument on stage while wearing a ring on her left pinky you know (laughs) yeah it it just gets more and more ridiculous but it's like ah but i'm the first so (laughs) spain sent salome and her song vivo cantando intro of the song is so lively and she is wearing this this pantsuit that is entirely fringe Mm -hmm. and there's this beautiful movement as she's like just completely into the intro yeah yeah and then the song starts and it like immediately stops all of that momentum and it's weird because i listened to this on spotify before watching the video and the two versions of the song are pretty different like the the studio track Starts out it from like a very like Shirley Bassey uh mm-hmm. place and then it gets into like the fun party vibe, whereas I thought the stage performance was kind of in the party vibe for most of the performance. Like one of my notes, Joanne Worley, like she just reminds me <laughs> of that, which I guess would be making it the most contemporary of the time, because that is like the laughing era. Mm-hmm. There's such an energy to the first part of this, to the intro of the song, and then it immediately slows down, and it takes forever to get back up to that energy, and that that killed mm-hmm. it for me. It's also one that has kind of Act Three problems, where it's just like it just keeps building and building. It's like, where is this going? What 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 is your exit strategy? Yeah, where, and... how does this end, Salome? Yeah. One thing I found super interesting about all four of these songs is that all four of them are like well under the three minute mark. Hmm. Yeah, and that could just been like the time. I would probably rank this one number four of of these, but it's the biggest earworm of the four. Like it has been stuck mm-hmm. in my head all day, but I'm not mad. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I, 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 even though it does have problems, and like I'm using problems loosely, uh, it's still fun. And mm-hmm. yeah, good job, Spain. So. Good job, Spain. <laughs> So the next one comes from the UK, and it's Lulu with Boom Bang a Bang. I was shocked by all the Lulu trivia that this, I learned yeah, like if, in preparing if we're for this episode. For ways to rank the songs, this one wins in like fun factoids. Oh my goodness! Because I I love putting music in context, and Lulu at this point already has like a U.S. number one hit with "To Sir with Love," like that happened in '67. Mm-hmm. So she is a well known quantity as as a performer, and like the UK did did a selection. 
uh, a song for Europe where people got the vote by postcard. So I really want to know how that worked. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyways, the entry that came in sixth of six entries was written by like some then unknown songwriting duo. It was like a song called I Can't Go On Living Without You. Uh, So again, sixth out of six doesn't do well. Doesn't get selected. The the people who wrote the song, Elton John and Bernie Taupin. Heard of them? Uh, <laughs> you know. Wow, that is so random. Yes. I'm familiar with, like, To Sir With Love. I had no idea just how successful that song was in the U.S. Like, it was the biggest selling single of the year that it came out. Like, it was huge. Mm-hmm. And even if I knew those particular facts and you told me to put them in chronological order... I would have put that after Eurovision. Like, yes. I would have said, like, oh, yeah, she went to Eurovision first, got name recognition, and then built her career from there. It's like, oh, no, this is, like, the 1969 equivalent of sending – well, maybe not sending Adele to Eurovision, but kind of of that mindset. This one feels kind of like a step down from Just Sir With Love. It's fine, but it's it's kind of very twee and very – I don't know. There's, there's not a lot there. I agree – with it, that. It, it feels like, like it, it, it feels very Eurovisiony in a, in a bad way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Although I I think she's selling the performance, even though uh from some of the articles that I've read, like she didn't even like the song all that much. But mm-hmm. yeah, she sells it. Yeah, she sells it, and she's totally professional about it, and uh, it worked out in the end. So <laughs> I mean, she's in a good place. Like Lulu married Maurice Gibb, one of the Bee Gees, like a few days before the contest. So you know, just. Just high on on marriage. I had no idea that she was married to a BG. Like <laughs> so random. Like it, yeah, well yeah, and like the like the weirdest one that like I almost like threw out, but it seemed like too good to to avoid like not talking about is that during the Gulf War in 1991, uh, the mm-hmm. BBC put together a blacklist of songs that they were not going to play on the radio, including Lulu's "Boom Bang a Bang" for titular reasons. <sighs> oh jeez. Which admittedly, like, can you imagine this song playing and? In 1991. I, I get what the BBC was trying to do. Like, Clear Channel did the same thing in 2001. It's gross, but at the same time, it's kind of darkly funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, oh, goodness. And yeah. What it what it lacks in, in longevity and quality as a song, it definitely makes up with it in great trivia factoids. Which, which leaves us with France. France sent Frida Baccara. With un jour en la fonte. Les branches d'une étoile, il trouve l'enfant, le chemin des grands. And this song feels very France. It does feel very France, but I think it might be my favorite of the four. I think Frida's just sang this incredibly well. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, she hit those power notes just effortlessly. And I think part of it is, like, early Eurovision was not about stage theatrics or being bombastic or anything like that. And she just sang the song. And, Mm -hmm. yeah, I I found it very moving. Uh, My only note was just, like, don't block your face. Like, she blocks her face a couple of times with her hands. (laughs) Don't block uh, your face immediately blocks face. Yes. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No. I. I think. I think the Netherlands is still my winner here, but this is a close number two. Mm-hmm. It did come down to France and Netherlands for hosting in 1970, and still unclear on which country actually won the coin toss. Uh, Netherlands hosted the following year, but mm-hmm. uh, that, that was is... <laughs> that a winning coin toss or a losing coin toss? Exactly. So <laughs> that one's lost to history. Yeah, and I don't really have any other notes about France. It's just like I like this song and. Yeah, there there is just like this wealth of fun trivia about the UK's entry, and then we just have France, and it's just one bullet point that says France, and then it's a link to the song. Maybe that is part of the point where it's just like there's all the conversation surrounding the UK, and I I think the UK was one of the favorites going into the contest, mm-hmm. but then you just have like the understatedness of France, and it's just like yep, just go in there to sing your song, kind kind of what happened with Portugal in 2017, where it's just like mm-hmm. oh yeah, it's just perform the song and it's great and i think what's really interesting about all this is this is the same year as woodstock and that just kind of boggles my mind because these songs do not sound contemporary with any of that sound Mm -hmm. but i don't know if it was just the eurovision being a couple years behind the times or 
what -hmm. was going on. But it's just like, okay, you have these four songs that are, I would say they're fairly similar, just in overall style. Mm -hmm. But well, thinking about thinking about this in context of Woodstock, which I had not done, which is great. Like, I kind of see like weird strains of what's going on in that particular sector of music in the entry from the Netherlands. Kind of, it feels very folky. Mm -hmm. It feels I don't know. Like I watched all of Ken Burns's country music, and that's all about all these strands of music that kind of interlace with one another and become country as we know Mm. it. And like, this definitely feels like in that same late sixties, early seventies space of, of folk music and guitar music coming to the forefront. That makes sense. And it also, it also seemed like there was an effort to try to add some like Spanish flair to all of the entries. Like the Netherlands entry was definitely, you could definitely get a flamenco Yes. Influence in there. Uh, Lulu finished her performance by screaming Ole at the end. Yeah, I think it is a, a case of like all of the strands just kind of coming together. And mm-hmm. I, I'm still boggled that like nobody had sat down and gone, What do we do if we tie? I know. Like, what that, if we do if there's a tie? Not just that it was a tie, but a four way tie. Yeah, like how, how do you not have a backup plan? Like, I, I can understand why the Scandinavian countries were rather yeah, cross we're, we're about like the not outcome. pleased and like, do, we're like yeah we're not going to come back in 1970 <sighs> for the first time that a tie happened for it to be this much of a tie is just kind mm. of amazing yeah anyways that's going to do it for this episode of the euro what thanks for listening the euro what podcast is hosted by ben smith that's me and mike mccomb that's me you can find us on our website at eurowhat.com and on twitter facebook and instagram at euro what we'd love to hear your questions and comments you can subscribe to the Euro What on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice. Rating and reviewing the podcast when you subscribe also helps other Eurovision fans find us, so keep doing that. Next time on the Euro What, we'll be talking about countries that haven't participated in Eurovision and why that's the case. <laughs>